Assessment and Management of Pulmonary Embolism The scenario is as follows. Miss Dolphy Smith is a 71-year-old female with a history of osteoarthritis and she came in complaining of acute shortness of breath and chest pain occurring an hour ago whilst watching TV. She describes the pain as sharp all over her chest and beginning suddenly, no radiation and made worse on breathing. She also complains that the shortness of breath is becoming worse. So here again we would pause and think about the differentials of acute shortness of breath with chest pain as this group of symptoms have a wide array of possible causes. These causes include a pulmonary embolism, pneumothorax, pneumonia, acute coronary syndrome, pericarditis and musculoskeletal pain and also rib fractures. The idea here is to use a clinical assessment and investigation to rule out the causes of these symptoms, beginning as always with assessing the patency of the airway. This is usually not an issue in a patient with a PE. Moving on to breathing, we check the respiratory rate saturations and perform a full respiratory examination. Patients suffering from a PE may be hypoxic, therefore prescribe oxygen if required. The type and rate of oxygen prescribed will depend on the extent of the hypoxia and coexisting conditions such as COPD. Palpating the chest wall will help in ruling out musculoskeletal pain, costochondritis, Tetsi syndrome. Percussing as part of a full respiratory examination will allude to the presence of a pneumothorax or pleural effusion being hyperresonant or dull respectively. If wheeze or crackles are heard, this may point towards acute heart failure, which may be caused by the PE itself or asthma or infection. Circulation. Here we would assess hemodynamic stability via the pulse, blood pressure, capillary refill time and perform a full cardiovascular exam. We can look for pericarditis if present via a pericardial friction rub and an increased JVP may be seen in a patient due to the pulmonary embolism causing increased pressure in the pulmonary artery. Disability GCS, we will check the GCS. A uh, point to note is that an elderly patient may present with delirium in atypical cases of PE so please do keep an eye out for this. So. At this stage, we would carry out any relevant examination. Notably here, we would look for calf tenderness, which will help allude to the cause of the PE. We also check the temperature. With initial investigations, we start off with the ABG, the result of which depends on the size of the embolus. The ABG may be normal if the size of the PE is small to medium, as this would not cause significant VQ mismatch. However, as the size of the PE increases, patient hyperventilation will result in a respiratory alkalosis. The larger the PE, the lower the PaO2. A very large embolus, such as a saddle embolus, may also cause a metabolic acidosis due to the hypoxemia and, and, and anaerobic metabolism. We would take bloods by default, FBCs using ECRP and clotting. A, di a D-dimer at this stage, if negative, would effectively rule out a PE. We also keep an eye out for signs of infection and also ACS. Um, we would one a troponin although a PE may also have an elevated troponin. The chest x-ray is often normal but is great for excluding pleural effusion, consolidation and pneumothorax as well as fractures as the source of the sh acute shortness of breath and chest pain. Approximately one-fifth of the time the ECG is normal although tachycardia is a common finding induced by hypoxemia. The key point here is that ACS is not associated with a tachycardia. T-wave inversions in the chest leads may point towards left ventricular strain. The classic S1, Q3, T3 pattern is not actually very common. It consists of a large S wave in lead 1, a large Q wave in lead 3 and a large T wave inversion in lead 3. White bundle branch block if present on the ECG is associated with an increased mortality. Quick point, why do these changes occur in a pulmonary embolism in terms of mechanism? Well, the pulmonary embolism causes di dilation of the right atrium and right ventricle and this may also lead to right ventricular ischemia and causes the manifestations of um, the ECG abnormalities. So here we have an ECG of a patient with a tachycardia and a right bundle branch block. 
this is another ECG and has the classic S1 Q3 T3 pattern. So CTPA is the golden standard for diagnosing a pulmonary embolism. We would also weigh the patient for treatment purposes. How likely is a person to have a PE? We can stratify the risk using the revised Geneva score. This consists of age being 65 or over scoring you 1 point, a history of venous thrombo embolism scoring you 3 points, recent surgery 1 point and an active malignant condition scoring 3 points. Now, tumor cells themselves induce a hypercoagulable state via several mechanisms, including the release of coagulant proteins. However, the treatments and immobility of a general cancer patient also increases the risk for the development of a PE. Bilateral cough tenderness gives us a free and pain palpation of the cough plus unilateral edema gives us a four. Hemoptysis 2 and heart rate above 95 is 5, whilst heart rate between 74 and 94 gives 3. The chance of a PE is low with a score between 0 and 3, likely 4 to 10, and very likely if the score is above 10 points. Another scoring system that we can use is the WELL score. Having signs and symptoms of DVT, such as calf tenderness, tachycardia, etc., scores 3 points. If the pulmonary embolism is the number one differential of the, patient's, of the patient based on symptoms, then a 3 is scored. Heart rate above 100 gives 1.5. Immobilization for three continuous days or if the patient has undergone surgery in the previous four weeks scores a, scores a 1.5. Previous, previously diagnosed PE DVT gives 1.5, hemoptysis 1 and malignancy a 1. With the well score, scores under 4 would be unlikely to have a PE and we would run a D-dimer to check. Above 4 is likely and we will carry out a CTPA. So the initial management of a PE. Airway support if required. Oxygen provided if saturation is dip below 94%. Heparin is commonly used in treating. It prevents emboli increasing in size. We can treat with unfractionated heparin with a loading dose of 75 units per kg, followed by a continuous IV infusion of 18 units per kilogram per hour. This should be monitored on a daily basis and adjusts made where needed. Or we can use lower molecular weight heparins, such as enoxaparin, daltiparin, tinsaparin. The recommended dose for enoxaparin is 1.5 mg per kilogram every 24 hours until adequate oral anticoagulation is established. Activated factor 10 inhibitors such as vivaroxaban, apixaban, edoxaban and fondoparinex can also be used. These are also known as the new oral anticoagulants. Recommended dose for vivaroxaban is initially 15 mg BD dose for 21 days followed by 20 mg once daily. We would provide pain relief where required. Fluid support and inotropic agents such as digoxin and meodoran should be given where required and thrombolysis, thrombolysis should be considered in patients with large PEs who are hemodynamically unstable. Definitive management involves continuing the heparin or factor 10 inhibitor until the INR is 2, at least a 2 on a vitamin K antagonist, notably warfarin, for a minimum of 5 days. Warfarin can be prescribed after the PE is confirmed. The target INR is usually 2.5 and should be maintained for 3 months. We can use the Fenerty re regime as a prescribing guideline. and. Counseling patients on warfarin therapy is also very important. Low molecular weight heparins are considered um, in patients with PEs associated with cancer. So here are the references used in this presentation. 
and this is the end of the lecture if you do have any questions or suggestions please 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 leave them in the comment section below if you want us to cover a topic please also drop us a comment thanks again for watching